Father, we thank you for this time and this opportunity that you have given us again to gather together and to get into the Word and to study the Word. We thank you, Father, that you are here with us, and we welcome you. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to understand the scriptures that we are speaking of tonight. Father, we just pray that you would just anoint every ear at the sound of my voice, that they would hear what the Spirit of the Lord has to say for the church today. Anoint every heart to receive in the name of Jesus. We thank you for this. And we just pray, God, that you would anoint and that you would just, your name would be glorified this evening, Father. That is our purpose, is to glorify you, Father. And we humble ourselves before thee, God. Thank you. Amen. So, <clears throat> why the tabernacle? Why did God want Moses and the priest to build a tabernacle? Exodus 25, 8 tells us, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. So God wanted to be near his people. Every detail of the tabernacle is a lesson. The tabernacle teaches. It was this designed to instruct God's people on how to know and worship the only holy God and king. The tabernacle was basically an illustration sermon on three subjects. Who God is, how we access God, and how we worship him. So does, have you had time to look up your scriptures? I need Exodus chapter 29, starting with verse 44 and reading through 46. I will sanctify also both Aaron and his sons to minister to me in the priest office. And I will dwell among the children of Israel and will be their God. And they shall know that I am the Lord their God that brought them forth out of the land of Egypt. And I may dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. Amen. God wants access to us. And he wants us to have access to him. In Numbers chapter 2 and chapter 3, God instructed Israel how to organize their family tents. Aaron, could you um, put up on the, the board behind me, show the encampment of Israelites' tribe in the wilderness? Each one has one of these. And you'll also see it up here. <clears throat> The priests were camped according to their divisions surrounding the tabernacle. The tribes were camped east, west, south, and north. In the middle is the tabernacle, which is also called the tent of congregation or the meeting place of God. A pillar of fire shoots out of heaven and comes to rest on the Ark of the Covenant, residing within the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle. We'll get into that later, not tonight, but in our lessons to come. The only way Israel's camp, or the only way Israel's enemy could defeat them was to get God, the Ark of the Covenant, out of the camp. The only way to do that was to corrupt their worship. The cross is our means of access. The only way our enemy can defeat us is if we step out from under the blood of Jesus or we give it away by doubt and unbelief. The tabernacle is designed to teach the world protocol for worshiping the king of kings. Every element and piece of furniture in the tabernacle teaches us an aspect of worship. Each piece of furniture prepares us for another step 
into his presence and a deeper level of access to our God. Malachi 3, 6 says, For I am the Lord, I do not change. Therefore, you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. Hebrews 13, 8, it tells us Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The God of the Old Testament is the same God of the New Testament. Most of the time, when Christians think of the Old Testament, they think of restrictions. The tabernacle is not about restrictions. It is about access. The tabernacle of the Old Testament was a building structure, which we have learned is a tent. We've also understand and learned that the tabernacle of the New Testament today is our bodies, which we've also learned is a tent or a temple. 1 Corinthians 3.16, do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Who has 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 4 through 6? Yes, while we are in this holy body, or excuse me, while we are in this body, we groan with the sense of being oppressed. It is not so much that we want to take something off, but rather to put something on over it, so that what must die may be swallowed up by the life. Moreover, it is God who has prepared us for this very thing, and as a pledge, he has given us his spirit. So we are always confident. We know that so, that so long as we are at home in the body, we are away from our home with the Lord. Amen. Hebrews 13, 14 in the New Living says, For this world is not our permanent home. We are looking forward to a home yet to come. So we are citizens of heaven. This earth is not our home. I grew up hearing that all the time. My grandfather could not wait to get to heaven. <laughs> he talked about heaven all the time. He kept telling everybody, this is not my home. My home is in heaven. The tabernacle, again, is not about restrictions. A lot of times people, when they think of the Old Testament, they'll completely shut it out. They won't read it. They won't go there. They won't study it because they think it's Old Covenant and it's full of restrictions. But we are learning that the Old Testament, the Old Tabernacle, is not restrictions. It's access. I'm going to read, I thought there was a good illustration here that um, Zach Neese, the author of the book that I am using some of his notes, he gave an illustration and I thought it was worth reading. He said, suppose my 10-year-old daughter asked me if she can go to a concert tonight in Austin. Sure, darling, have a blast, I tell her. I toss her the car keys, put her on on the back, pat her on the back, and go about my business. What's the problem with that? You see, I have only given her permission to attend a concert, and I made a way for her to get there, but she is still not able to go. Let's consider her obstacles. First, my daughter doesn't have a ticket or any money. Second, though I provided the car, she is only 10 and can't legally drive it. Third, she has no idea how to drive. Fourth, she is very resourceful, but doesn't know how to get from Dallas to Austin. She will have to reference a map so she can find the way to I-35, then find South, and go past Hillsboro, Temple, Waco, Round Rock, and all before she ever finds Austin. What kind of dad would give his kids permission to go somewhere but not teach them the way? You see, permission and ability may and can are two different things. As worship leaders, we do the same thing. 
We pump people up trying to get them to worship. And then we wonder, why is it that when people gather for worship service, they do not fully engage in worship? Why don't they ever come as close to God as we should come? The people have permission, but we have not equipped them with the ability. We have pointed them up the mountain, however, we have not led them there. Jesus has made a way for us to come into God's presence. And God, in his heavenly wisdom, knew that we would need to be led and shepherd there. That is why he provided the tabernacle. As a worship community, we have embraced God's permission. However, we have not taken the time to learn God's way, to let him lead us through the process. That's why I felt this lesson, this, this um, series was so important. I've been in worship all my life, ever since I was old enough to play the piano, 13, 12, 13 years old. I never in my mind ever wondered what worship was. It was just something we did. The old and the new model of worship. Moses' tabernacle is a model or a shadow of heavenly worship. Heavenly worship is not Old Testament or New Testament. It is a shadow or a type of worship that has already taken place in heaven. Matthew 6 is where Jesus teaches his disciples to pray that God would do things of heaven on earth. If we want the kingdom and the power of heaven on earth, then it's time we incorporated the worship of heaven on earth. So what does it mean, shadow of heavenly worship? Everyone here, probably young and old, has, has some time in their life watched the cartoon Peter Pan. <laughs> I remember it. We first see Peter flying through Wendy's bedroom, chasing his shadow. Peter catches it, and Wendy helps him sew it onto his shoe. Everyone knows there is no strength in a shadow. However, the shadow represents something with strength. This is where the Israelites fell into error. They thought they could actually be saved by following the rituals of tabernacle worship. Read with me Hebrews chapter 10, 1 through 4. For the law, having a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with these same sacrifices, which they offer continually, year by year, make those who approach perfect. For then who would have not ceased to be offered? For the worshippers, once pur purified, would have no more consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. All right. So scripture clearly tells us that those sacrifices and rituals had no effect. They didn't save anyone. The tabernacle of the Old Testament is a shadow of something real and powerful. Amen. Hebrews chapter 9, 11 and 12. Who has that? But Christ, being come a high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood. Amen. He entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. So these scriptures describe the heavenly sanctuary. The new covenant gives us full, access to God always. Amen. The Old Testament sanctuary is a shadow of the heavenly sanctuary. Amen? 
So there's some ground rules for stewarding tabernacles. Now keep in mind when we're talking about tabernacles, we're talking about two types of tabernacles. We're using the tabernacle in Moses' time and our tabernacle, which is our temples. Okay? <clears throat> God only accepts free will offerings. There's always a choice. In Exodus 25, 2, it says, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they bring me an offering of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart, and you will take my offering. You see, the gods of Egypt would demand sacrifices and threaten their people under pain of retribution to bring them offerings. Our Heavenly Father doesn't squeeze us dry. He doesn't want to take advantage of us. He will not use guilt or fear to force us into submission. We are not tools in the hands of God. We are children in the arms of a father. There is a reason why God calls his people sheep and not cattle. You drive cattle, but you lead sheep. As worship leaders, we don't get frustrated with congregations for not responding the way we would like them to. We should never scold a congregation or manipulate them to get them to respond appropriately. Let's look at Numbers chapter 20, verses 7 through 11. We see in this, this, these scriptures, this is where Israel, the Israelites were complaining again. They were complaining to Aaron and to Moses because they didn't have water. Okay? So chapter 20, 7 through 11. And the Lord said to Moses, You and Aaron must take the staff and assemble the entire community. As the people watch, speak to the rock over there, and it will pour out its water. You will provide enough water from the rock to satisfy the whole community and their livestock. So Moses did as he was told. He took the staff from the place where it was kept before the Lord. Then he and Aaron summoned the people to come and gather at the rock. Listen, you rebels, he shouted. Must we bring you water from this rock? Then Moses raised his hand and struck the rock twice with the staff, and water gushed out. So the entire community and their livestock drank their fill. So God instructed Moses to speak to the rock. And Moses struck it twice. He's a little angry, a little frustrated. Because of his disobedience, Moses could not enter the promised land. It should serve as a warning. Frustrated browbeating only dishonors God. We teach people how to worship by example. Through our encouragement, our demonstration, through our study in the word, our only responsibility is to obey and follow his lead. We are not res responsible for the results. So another ground rule for stewarding um, tabernacles is God wants worshipers' hearts. Amen. Exodus 35, 21. They came, everyone whose heart steered him up, and everyone whom his spirit made willing, and they brought the Lord's offering to the work of the tabernacle of the congregation and not for all his service and for his holy garments. I said, and not, but I meant, and for all his service and for the holy garments. It is his spirit who makes people willing to respond to him. Philippians 2.13 says, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. Jesus demonstrated his passion for us in order to win our passion for him. Jesus' sacrifice was more than just physical. Jesus' heart was pierced 
and broken in order to redeem our emotions and our affections. Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven 37 says, Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all of thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. If God wins the heart, he has won the whole person. If worship is not from the heart, it isn't worship at all. Our job as priests is to obey him by helping make opportunities for people to meet with him. Obedience is our part. The results is God's part. So, um, Aaron, next, if you could show us the picture of the tabernacle. You guys have this picture. I kind of, I drew this. So the one up here is a little different. I drew this one for you when I first started the studies months ago. Anyways, same idea. Tabernacle. We're going to talk about entering into the tabernacle. Exodus 25, or chap, Exodus chapters 25 through chapter 40. We're not reading that, but you guys can take it and take it home and read it. It is very interesting. It is the biblical accounts of the tabernacle's construction. The tabernacle is extremely detailed. Everything in the tabernacle means something. That's why God was so specific about its construction. Remember, part of our job as priests are to set up meeting places between God and man. The tabernacle is God's revelation of the process that leads us deeper into his presence. The tabernacle is a heavenly service order for worship. It is eternal and is going on right now in heaven. So let's look at the gates. You see the gate? You see the tabernacle. After you enter into the gate, you have the outer courtyard. Okay? The tabernacle or the meeting place is where the table of showbreads and all that is. We'll get into that at a later time. Tonight we're going to talk about the gate. In terms of worship, what is the gate? And how do we go through it? John 10, 9 says, Yes, I am the gate. Those who come in through me will be saved. They will come and go freely and will find good pastures. That's found in New Living Translation. I usually use New King James. So John 14 says, or 14, 6 says, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. If you want people to come into the courts, we must take them to the gate. We must sing songs about Jesus and what he has done. Jesus is the way and cannot be excluded from the recipe. Now, I thought it was interesting because I looked up the gate. I didn't have time to really go into details about the gate. The, in the Old Testament, the gates w didn't have latches, okay? They were curtains. They were kind of like, you know, veils. And people would stand in front of them and, you know, they would enter into the gates after they presented what they were doing. But I thought it was interesting because Zach has mentioned um, in his study most gates have latches. And it isn't enough to walk up to the gate and stand there. To enter in, the latch must be worked and the gate must be opened. When we lead people to the gate, which is Jesus, the way we lead them there should inspire praise and gratitude. The gospel inspires gratitude. 
Psalms 104 says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. Thanksgiving and praise positions our hearts to come closer to God. We lead people into God's courts simply by leading them to Jesus, testifying of the things that he has done, especially the cross, and express thankfulness and praise that he is who he is and he has done what he has done. Jesus is the greatest worship leader that ever lived. Let's read um, Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. Who has that? Chapter 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Amen. Jesus is the high priest. He is the priest of heaven, the worship leader of God. Scripture shows us that whenever Jesus did anything, he was leading people into meetings with his Father. He was inspiring worship and praise. He was carrying the presence of God, and he was ministering to his Father's heart and blessing people. Three job descriptions of the priest. Do you remember what they were? Carrying the presence of God, ministering to God, and blessing his people. Jesus was our example. Amen? Let's look up uh, Luke 19, verse 33 through 40. But as they loosed the colt, the owners of it said to them, Why are you loosing the colt? They said, The Lord has need of him. Then they brought him to Jesus and threw their own clothes on the colt, and they sat Jesus on him. And as he went, many spread their clothes along the road. Then, as he was now drawing near the descent of Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice, for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in the heavens and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep quiet, the stones would immediately cry out. Amen. Amen. So Jesus ministered by entering through the gates with praise. Why did Jesus enter Jerusalem with such fanfare and celebration? He was teaching us something about worship. Jesus is the king, and kings come into their kingdom with honor, praise, celebration, and triumph. May the rocks never cry out because I fail to praise him. Amen? So do you still have, do you uh, keep that picture of the tabernacle up there? It's going to lead us into the next thing. The first thing that you see, a person would see when coming through the tabernacle gates was the altar of sacrifice. Exodus 27, 1 through 8, we're not going to read it, but it describes the construction of the altar. The altar was made of, and I'm going to be very careful here it's, <laughs> to pronounce this right, acacia wood. 
It is overlaid with brass. God used this particular type of wood because it doesn't rot easy. It is a symbol of purity of soul, of incorruptible humanity. Because of its sturdiness and resistance to decay, it is also a symbol of resurrection and immorality. The altar stood between five and six feet tall with a square base. Each corner of the altar was capped with a brass or a bronze horn. Could you put up there now the picture of the altar for me? Bronze is a biblical symbol for judgment. In Deuteronomy 28:15, the Bible says, but it shall come to pass if you do not obey the voice of your Lord God to observe carefully all his commandments and his statutes, which I command you today, all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. The judgment of sin requires payment. Sin separates God and man. Now let me say something here, because a lot of times people get confused. They think the scriptures that says nothing separates you from the love of God, they think, oh, we're never going to be separated. But I'm here to tell you sin will separate you from God. Nothing separates you from God's love for you. However, sin will separate you from having access to God. Numbers chapter 21, the people of Israel were complaining and speaking against God. Poisonous snakes came into the camp, killing many of them. The people asked for forgiveness, and God instructed Moses to make a bronze snake and place it on a tall pole. If anyone bitten looked at the bronze snake, that person would live. Read for me John chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. What does that say? I got it. Chapter 3, 14 and 15. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Amen. The bronze snake is a symbol of Jesus being lifted up on the cross to bear the judgment for our sins. And all who look upon him will be saved from that judgment. The altar is constructed of wrought resistant wood covered with bronze. Jesus, pure, immortal, and incorruptible, took on. He was covered in our sin. His perfect life carried the judgment of God for us. Thank you, God. John 1, 29, the Bible says, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. This is the ultimate image of the altar. Psalms 118, 27, God is the Lord which have showed us light Bind the sacrifice with cords, even into the horns of the altar. Just keep that picture there for me for a little bit longer. The horns of the altar represented mercy. When a person in the Israel camp deserved judgment and needed forgiveness, they would run into the sanctuary and take hold of the horns of the altar and cry mercy. Exodus 29, 12 tells us, Thou shalt take the blood of the bullock and put it upon the horns of the altar with thy finger and pour all the blood beside the bottom of the altar. So we see how the animal's throats 
was then cut and its blood poured out at the foot of the altar. And the body was then placed on the four horns. The priest burned a sacrificial portion on the altar as a sweet aroma to the Lord. That was worship. The altar was a place of sacrifice, and worship has to have an altar. 2 Corinthians 2.15 tells us, For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. The very first step into God's sanctuary is a step of sacrifice. The altar is situated right in front of the gate in God's sanctuary because access to God is impossible without a blood sacrifice. Worship begins with the death of Christ on the cross. Aside from this, there is no access or ministry to God. Amen? God won't be enthroned on human pride. So in order to come closer to God, we have to kill our pride, burn it up, and leave it at the door. It is at the brazen altar that we constrain our emotions and body submit them to God, and offer up our lives as living sacrifices of praise and thanksgiving. Amen. Romans 12, 1 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Our bodies are the temple of God. Amen. Our bodies are the tabernacle. Amen. Worship that does not entail submission is not worship. So now turn with me to John 4, verse 23 and 24. You worship, I'm sorry. 23, but the hour is coming, <clears throat> and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Amen. Worshiping in truth is worshiping through Jesus and realizing that the Son is the only way to truly access the Father. He said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes unto the Father except by me. Worshipers are people who humble themselves before God. They submit to Jesus' lordship. Worshippers are citizens of their father's kingdom, submitting to his desires and rules, and entitled to all the protections and benefits of his throne. Let's read Matthew chapter 21, verse 12 and 13. And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all those who were buying and selling in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a robber's den. Jesus is teaching us something about stewarding the house of God and creating an environment where he is welcome. 1 Corinthians 6.19 says, Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have from God, 
and you are not your own. Keeping the temple of God clean is an act of worship and an invitation to God's presence. So you're probably wondering what all this stuff is. Kylie, if you and Arona could come up here with me, they're going to help me out here. This is what I call spoilers alert. It's what this stuff is. As you can see, we have some clothes which re represent fashion. Not that they're fashionable, but it represents the thought. We have entertainment. We have exercises. We have some kind of sport. We have food, games, magazines. There's all kinds of stuff here that people can be involved in, which we all are involved in. None of these things represent here is necessarily bad by nature. We all like to eat. <laughs> we like nice clothes. A matter of fact, someone just shared with me today, they sent me a picture online of some shoes that cost $625. And I thought, oh boy, not me. <laughs> but believe it or not, there are people that are really, you know, they love fashion. <laughs> and they'll do anything to get the nicest thing. <laughs> We like to watch TV, we like to go to movies, we use computers, we play video games, we do sports. <clears throat> we exercise, some of us are very, go to exercise, you know, the gym, you know, we're, good. We, we're committed there. We hang out with friends and families. There's nothing wrong with that. The problem arises when these things begin to pull at our affections. When our hearts learn, lean more towards exercising or maybe a sport than towards prayer, when our hearts lean more towards food, friends, entertainment than it does towards God, there is a problem. A house of prayer is a life of open communication and communion, which is a relationship with God. We are his temple, and our ears and heart are in tune to his voice. We become a house of prayer. You girls can sit down for a minute. I'll be calling you back in a second. Hopefully it's not soon. John 10.10 10 says, the thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Anything that competes against the voice of God for my ear is a thief. If my favorite show calls to my heart more loudly than the word of God and prayer, it is a robber. Anything that steals from that communication and communion with God robs me and God of our relationship with each other. My temple then becomes a den of thieves. You see, I thought about this, and I never thought about it before until I was studying. I've read this scripture many times where Jesus went into the temple and cleaned it out and called them the den of thieves. And I always thought he was just angry because they were just doing things in the temple of God that they shouldn't be doing, right? But the way that this is worded, we are the temple. We have a responsibility to our temples, to God. We are to keep them. Nothing is to be interfering with our relationship with our Heavenly Father. Nothing is to rob us from that relationship. And if it is, it's considered a den of thieves. He wasn't really talking about a building. He was talking about us. Worship flips the tables of compromise in our heart. It invites Jesus to come into his temple 
my life and examine the table of my heart. Worship is temple sweeping. Hebrews 12, 14 says, pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. Holiness is when I present the table of my heart to God and say, Lord, this is my heart and it is yours. You purchased it at a high price. It is yours to use as you wish. You may place it on anything you wish, or you may place anything on it that you wish, and you, remain, you may remove anything off of it that you wish. Bottom line is, it's, my, it's not my will, but your will be done, God. Jesus was the prime example of that at the cross. He prayed, Father, if it be thy will, take this cup from me. But nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. He was our greatest example. Are you guys doing okay? We're almost done. So, now, could you show us the picture of the tabernacle again? You guys have the form. <clears throat> Between the altar of sacrifice and the tent of meeting, which is that middle section there with the, the altar of incense, the table of showbreads. Between the altar and the tent of meeting, we find the brazen laver. I think I pronounced that right. So someone read for me Exodus chapter 30, verses 18 through 21. Make a bronze basin with its bronze stand for washing. Place it between the tent of meeting and the altar and put water in it. Aaron and his sons are to wash their hands and feet with water from it. Whenever they enter the tent of meeting, they shall wash with water so that they will not die. Also, when they approach the altar to minister by presenting a food offering to the Lord, they shall wash their hands and feet so that they will not die. This is to be a lasting ordinance for Aaron and his descendants for the generations to come. Aaron, could you show the picture of the laver for me now? Exodus 38, 8 says, He made the laver of bronze and its base of bronze from the bronze mirrors of the serving women who assembled at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. So you see the picture of the brazen bronze. I got it to the best of like, they had all kinds of pictures, but I got it to the best of scriptures that I could find. <clears throat> Scripture informs us that the laver was constructed with a bowl on top and also a foot. Some scholars believe that both the top and the base held water so that the priests could wash their hands and feet before entering the holy place. Moses made the basin of bronze with its, ba with its base of bronze from the mirrors of the women who served at the entrance of the tent meeting. Mirrors in Moses' day were made of highly polished bronze. Moses was instructed to take those mirrors and melt them down and make the laver out of them. The laver was then polished into a highly reflective surface so that when the priests came to wash at the laver, they saw the reflection in the water. The priests did no ministry of any kind in the tabernacle without washing in the laver first. The bronze laver represents the ministry of the word. The labor is the continuing washing, the daily cleansing that comes from the ministry of the word of God. Let's read Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 through 27.
for husbands, this means love your wives. Is it that? Yeah, that's what. Uh, for husbands, this means love your wives, just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her, present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. Okay. He is saying here that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. I thought that was, that was a catch there. You see, washing of water by the word. That's why it's so important to read your word. It washes, it cleanses. James 1.23, for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. The mirror serves two, fun two purposes. Number one, a mirror can be used for vanity. The biblical definition of vanity, and this is a, I'm going to try to read it slow because it's a lot. It's a lot to take in. It says, vanity of a person is seen as having excessive estimation or overestimation of oneself, abilities, looks, or other attributes that makes them have an excessive belief in their own abilities or attractiveness to others. Perhaps this is, was the reason that a certain piece of bedroom furniture is called a vanity because it has a mirror and it focuses on the person looking into it. Solomon wrote more about vanity than any other author in the Bible and more so in Ecclesiastics where vanity is mentioned 32 of the 35 times in the Bible. I'm not going to take the time to read it. There's references there. You can go home and study that on your own. The Bible is not given to us to puff us up to puff up our pride and be conceited. The Bible is not given to us to compare ourselves with other people. 2 Corinthians 10, 12 says, for we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend others, or themselves, I'm sorry, who commend themselves. For they, measuring themselves by themselves, and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. The second purpose of a mirror, it can be used as a tool of self-revelation. It reflects what we really look like. It reveals truth. When the priests wash themselves in the water, they pause to reflect. They looked into the laver and saw that they fell short, but then washed in the same water, and they were cleansed for ministry. The Word of God also serves two functions. When we submit ourselves to the Word, it reveals that we, what we really look like and what God really looks like. It is the washing with the word that reveals our minds, transforms us into Christ likeness, and enables us to know the will of God. Amen? 2 Corinthians 3.18, but we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. God washes our hands so that our work can be clean. He washes our feet so our paths may be righteous. And he washes our minds and our hearts to make us like him. 
Most people don't like to hear the word judgment. At least uh, people, I have known people that's been in the grace movement. They just, they don't like that word, you know. But there's good judgment. Judgment has become a bad word in our post pottery culture. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 31, 31, it says, For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. Christ's examination leads to self-examination. Self-examination leads to self-discovery, which enables us to come clean with God, which then enables God to clean us. The laver represents the washing of the word. It is impossible to receive the word without first submitting ourselves to God. Let's look at John chapter 13, verses 5 through 8. John chapter 13, 5 through 8. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, what I am doing, you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Amen. Jesus wasn't washing the disciples' feet to save them. He was cleansing the soil of the world off their feet. He was teaching them the protocols of priesthood. He was about to have communion with them. But before a priest can enter into the holy place and commune with God, he must first wash in the laver or the laver. Jesus consecrated his disciples as priests. The disciples were literally being washed with water by the word himself, Jesus Christ, in person. John 1.14 says, The word became flesh and dwelt among us. Let's turn to John chapter 13, verses 12 through 5. We're almost done, I think. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you, he asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. I remember growing up in church, we did washing of feet just as much as we did communion. I remember that, growing up in the church. And I used to think, you know, they're washing my feet, you know. That's what, because we're doing what Jesus says, right? But as I'm studying this, we're learning that the washing is of the water, of the word. It's the word that washes us. So you're washing with the word of God. That's what Jesus was illustrating. It wasn't about washing their feet. He was washing them with the word. He was the word. And he told us to do the same. Jesus provided the ultimate example of turning earthen vessels into vessels of honor. Just as he did with the disciples, Jesus saved us, consecrated us, and is washing us daily with his word. 
filling us with his presence so that he can turn, so that we can turn and wash others with the word. You got that picture? It's really hard. It's deep. <laughs> As worship leaders, we need to know our job and know where we are leading people. We need to remember that the people, the congregation, we're leading into ministry. They have to be washed with the water of the word. It is our responsibility and honor to come daily to the labor and wash ourselves in the water of the word. We cannot live off the leftovers from our pastor or any other Christian's relationship with God. We must each learn to come to God ourselves and let him fill us. Handling holy vessels. The priests cleansed themselves at the laver right before they went into the holies of holies to minister to the Lord. A priest could not handle the holy vessels, which were cups and spoons and censers, with unclean hands. The consequence was death. In 2 Corinthians 4, 7, it says, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. You and I, as priests, handle holy vessels every day. We are vessels of clay. God puts his presence inside of us. We are earthen vessels. The only thing that makes us holy is the spirit that we contain. To God, we are priceless and holy. The washing of the word prepares our hearts and our hands to safely minister to and to handle God's holy vessels. 1 Timothy 2.8, I desire, therefore, that the men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. So let's talk about broken vessels. 2 Timothy 2.20, but in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. 1 Peter 2.9, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of the darkness and into his marvelous light. Turn with me to Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. You guys doing okay? We're still hanging in there? Colossians 3, 12 through 14. Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Amen. Um, above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. All right. So you may be a vessel that has been mishandled a few times. You may have put things in your vessel or done things that you fear may have invalidated your warranty. However, God chose you, and he loves you. God chose to put the treasure of his presence in our frail vessels so that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. 
glorifying God. Amen? Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Isaiah 61, 3, it says to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that they may be glorified. So can I have my helpers come back up here for a second? Remember what I told you to do? Yeah. Okay. Just do it. Here, I'll take this. You hand her the bowl. And don't do anything till I tell you, okay? You got to put that over the bowl. I'll tell you when. There is actually a benefit to putting water in a broken vessel. You gotta hold the cup up a little high. If the purpose of the vessel is to water the world, a broken vessel leaks. Go ahead. Start pouring it, overflowing. Overflowing all the way to the top. God takes the broken vessel and he fills it with overflowing with the water of life, and anywhere it goes, it leaks. Through those same mistakes I thought would disqualify me, through those same wounds that the devil thought would destroy me, God gushes through them all. Hallelujah. Okay, girls, here, I'll help you. Bring it back. <laughs> Yeah, just dump it in. Hand it to me. Thank you. I want to take a minute here. If you got, if you, if I have your, I feel this is a time to share this. Last week, after I spoke, my whole week has been warfare. And I, I wrestled with this because I thought, no, God, I'm not going to talk about me, and I'm not going to talk about Satan. But the more I wrestled with it, the more I feel that I need to share because I believe there's er everybody deals with our enemy. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 says, and he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly... I would, will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon you. Your enemy, the devil, will try to disqualify you. He never stops trying to silence your voice. Last week in our lessons, I shared the story about Paul and Silas in prison. And when I strayed away from my notes, I found myself in some trouble. I gave an illustration which I confused two stories, two different accounts, one with Paul, who was in prison, and one with Peter, who was in prison. Both stories were in the Bible, and I know the stories. I just got the names messed up. All week long, all week long, the devil has attacked my character, trying to convince me that what I said last week had disqualified me. Trying to discourage me, trying to silence my voice so I'd never get up and teach again. However, as the battle continued in my mind, the word of God spoke, reminding me who I am in Christ. Scripture started flooding through my mind. Revelations 12.10 saying, talking about the accuser of our brethren who accused them before God day and night. He has been cast down. 
You know you have an enemy that stands before God and accuses you day and night. But it's all good because he can't disqualify you. The battlefield is in the mind. The more I thought about what was said, the more I started becoming humble. It really humbled me because I sensed the fear of the Lord, because I sensed the responsibility that it carries when you're teaching people. It shook me up. I talked to my husband. You ask him, I wrestled with it all week. He's like, you're, over, you're good, honey. You're good. Well, I know I'm good. But we deal with situations. We are frail vessels. We're broken. We make mistakes. But the enemy can never disqualify us. The only thing that disqualifies you is if you walk out from under the blood of Jesus or if you give the enemy access because of doubt and unbelief. This is why the word of God is so important because when you know the word, when you are being attacked, the word comes in and floods you and you build the strength up. It doesn't matter. I've said it before. It doesn't matter what men thinks. All that matters is what God thinks. So if one person here tonight walks away from here encouraged, I don't know who you are, but I, I, I just felt I needed to share that. We're talking about broken vessels. It's through those same mistakes that I thought I would be disqualified for, through the same wounds that the devil thought would destroy me. God gushes through them all. He's got your back. He has your back. Our greatest contribution to the kingdom of God is allowing God to use our failures, which the devil meant for evil, and turning it around for good. In Genesis 50, verse 20, this is talking about, now here I go saying again, I hope I'm not getting the names mixed up. <laughs> um, I think it's Joseph with the many colors where his brothers turned on him. Did I say it right? Okay, this is where his brothers had come after he had been in slavery. They came to him and bowed before him. Genesis 50, 20 says, but as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. In order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. You see, we are overcomers by the blood of the lamb and by the word of your testimony. People need to know who you are and who your God is. Rome, um, let, me, let me go on. God sees us through the blood of Jesus. Jesus' blood not only cleanses us, it bathes us in his word and reveals the essential beauty of who God created us to be. God created you to his specifications of beauty, not the world's. <laughs> My percep perception of how God sees me has everything to do with how I worship him. That's why we come to the laver to wash before we come to the holy place for intimacy. Romans 5, 8 said, but God demonstrates his own love towards us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God is love, and his passion is the language of our heart. Amen. That is what worship is. Amen. Zephaniah 2.8, for thus says the Lord of hosts, he sent me after glory to the nations which plundered you. For, you, for he who touches you touches the apple of my eye. You are the apple of his eye, 
and he cares for you. You are precious in his sight. This is my ending statement. Who has Song of Solomon, verse or chapter 4, verse 9 through 11? You have captured my heart, my treasure, my bride. You hold it hostage with one glance of your eyes, with a single jewel of your neck. Your love delights me, my treasure, my bride. Your love is better than wine, your perfume more fragrant than spices. Your lips are as sweet as nectar, my bride. Honey and milk are under your tongue. Your clothes are scented like the cedars of Lebanon. Amen. Your beauty has caught God's eye. Your love has ravished his heart. And your worship is like a kiss on his lips. That's all I had. Next week, we're going to get into the furniture, the table of showbread, and the golden lampstand. We're going to dive into that. Okay, I guess I get to pray. <laughs> oh. Father, I thank you for your love. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your mercy. I thank you, God, that you do love us and that you watch over us. I thank you, Father, for who you are. I pray, Father, that you would take this word and as we go through the week, that the Holy Spirit would bring back to remembrance the things that we need to understand and know and apply to our lives. We thank you, Father, that your teacher is there teaching us as we go along our way. Father, we just pray that as everyone gets ready to take off and go to their separate ways that you will travel with them. Your mercies will go before them. Your angels will encamp about them. You will protect them, watch over them, and bring us back at our appointed time the next time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.